bit of uh, background on you guys. How many, I'm curious, how many of you guys are looking to kind of just be amateur versus pro to I'm absolutely going for it. I'm just curious what the, the audience is here. Like, what's the mentality of everybody here? So, like, tailor everything exactly to what you want and need. Start with the guy, what you want to do. Yeah. You guys are, you guys are playing, so come on. You don't need to be cautious now. <laughs> get cautious, get knocked out. Um, You've already had a few fights, right? Yeah, well, three fights. Uh, two fights, I did uh, Golden Gloves uh, with him, with, uh, I think, March. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so. So, go you want to just say amateur, you want to try to turn pro? Or like yeah, I'll try to. Get to the top level and be elite. Yeah, I'll take it as far as I can. Okay. Right, good to know. Love this. <laughs> now, now, now this is fun. Oh, wait, so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would do, right now, I just want to take it step by step. You know, start a couple of amateur fights. I still haven't fought my first fight yet, so. Okay. Yeah, that's coming up, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you step up in the water. Mm -hmm. But after that, yeah, keep, keep um, rising that level, maybe hopefully, to the professional and keep it, keep it moving. You like getting hit? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we gotta do it. All right. Whatever you want. So, if you get hit, there's all the more uh, motivation to get out of the way. Got it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> How about yourself? Um, I haven't really thought that far ahead in terms of professional. Um, I'm not quite new to this like him. I haven't had my first fight yet. Um, I want to kind of dabble in everything. So, boxing, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu wrestling. But, you know, it's, it's highly suggested that I give up baseball. Basically, so I started with Muay Thai and kickboxing. So I just I'm just here to test myself. You know, that's all. Love it. You know, I always found that individuals that kind of float through life, it doesn't really form the calluses that helps you propel you to that next level of whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, sports are a great way to do that, and testing yourselves and pushing yourselves each and every single day, I always found it helps you to reach those new heights. The company that we started here is called Functionized, which literally means optimizing your function and making yourself a better version of yourself each and every day. So you woke up this morning, hopefully a better version of yourself than you were yesterday morning, and tonight when you go to bed, hopefully you'll be a better version of yourself than when you woke up this morning. Rinse, lather, repeat, over and over and over again. So a little bit about myself, my name is Jim, and I have been in strength conditioning pretty much all my life. Uh, played baseball up to the highest of levels, uh, coached at the highest of levels as a strength and conditioning coach, was in football, uh, Buccaneers, the Toronto Blue Jays, got off of doing that and started working with the guys individually, which I got a lot more satisfaction out of doing, got bored, went to, as we called it, doctor school, <laughs> met Dr. Brandon over here, as you guys know, Mike, the, uh, the guy that throws the punches around as well. Dr. Shante, his PhD, she's peak performance coach. You guys know what peak performance really is? No. So it's taking the mental game to that next level. Getting yourself out of your own way to achieve new goals. Most top Fortune 500 CEOs, uh, top professional athletes, all have a performance coach they work with. It's not sitting down on the couch and saying what your mommy daddy issues are. We all have mommy daddy issues, let's face it. It's about where are you now, where you want to be, and let's get you there. As most efficient as possible. And she's been working with pros for a while now and doing a bang up job, I gotta say. I mean, when they're winning championships and getting paid higher contracts, mission accomplished. So what we kind of got here, I'm gonna give you a little overview on some nutrition 101, or let's call it 202 here. Um, Dr. Shantae here is gonna hit some peak performance. Dr. Brandon is going to get a lot more into what do you do before a fight? Recovery. How do you get yourself back into the ring after doing a weight cut? And do you want to walk around overweight? Or do you want to kind of be there and maintain? I mean, you know, certain individuals decide to walk around at a 200 pounds when they're fighting at 154. <laughs> a little, little different. So. I'm on that uh, Fury show. How he's uh, big and tubby. You, know? right. you guys seen the, uh, the Fury show on Netflix now? It, it's entertaining. It's like watching, uh, uh, what's his face, the, uh, the, the singer, um, 
Okay. Osborne's. <laughs> Osborne's, but boxing. <laughs> it, it's a hoop. That's funny. All right. So when it comes to nutrition here, there's definitely a science behind it. And a lot of athletes, even at the highest levels, don't really get it. But once they truly get it, man, it's uncanny how much they perform. A lot of what goes on with you guys, with all of us actually in here who, who train very hard every single day, we have higher level of stress. And then we go out into this world, which is freaking insane at this point, and we have even higher level of stress. So we're constantly in that fight or flight stage, the sympathetic response. Anyone familiar over here with sympathetic response? It's okay. All right, fight or flight. You're either going to fight the wild beast coming at you, or you're going to run as fast as you can and not be eaten. If we're in a constant state like that, what's going on is we're not digesting, cortisol levels are up, we're not really breaking down fat, we are designed in that case to perform and then stop. And if we're not stopping, we're not turning that off. We're not able to digest. The cells aren't able to take those nutrients that we need. So that's where Dr. Shante is going to come in here and talk about in a few how to come down with that. There's something called uh, heart rate variability, which is there's basic apps for free. You can have to download or pay the extra 10 bucks now or get some high tech $10 million system that we have to get for all this kind of stuff and test yourself. You can actually figure out what days are better for you to go harder versus the days that you might need to actually have a recovery day. The recovery aspect of it, as you may know, is everything. You put in 110% in here and you don't recover. You go out and bust yourself and do some more hill sprints and you come back in here the next day. You might be able to get away with that a couple times, but you're not going to get away with that forever. And then what's going to happen is injury. And you start breaking down, you scratch your head, what's going on here? I I'm eating right, I think I'm doing the right things, but you're just overtraining. So that's going to start backing you down a little bit off that. Um, Sleep. How many guys here get the 7.6 hours of sleep that is required? That's the actual, actual number. <laughs> um, everyone always rounds it up to eight, but 7.6 hours of sleep. Who here gets seven hours of sleep a night at least? Awesome. Oh, yeah. Good job. You guys are a rarity. I I'm hitting five at max. <laughs> I'm injured all the time. So <laughs> there's something to be said about that. Sleep helps, obviously, with recovery. You ever guys ever take a nap from time to time? There's nothing wrong, there's nothing about saying that you can't, as a grown man, actually take a nap from time to time. 20 minutes, an hour, cool. It was National Nap Day the other day. Was it? Was uh, it the day? Yeah, 9.39 a.m. is the prime time nap. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> We're gonna get in also here with motion, just movement. Between sessions, you guys sit on the couch, get in front of the computer, play in the little texture boxes, I like to call it there, or, Maybe take a walk. That's uh, actually a fun question. All three of you guys trained here this morning. Have any of you guys done rehab in the last few hours since you left here? <laughs> what are you fitting for? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> so, all these things come into being a peak performer. And the whole idea, if you're going to be a better version of yourself tonight when you go to bed than you were when you woke up this morning, you got to be a peak performer. You guys have fights coming up. Do you want to be at your absolute best that you possibly can be? Because, no offense, you got somebody trying to literally kill you. They want to cause bodily harm to you guys in the sport of it. And hopefully you guys want to do the same thing to them. Whoever's at the best performance, whoever's trained the best, whoever's the best technique at the end of the day is going to be victorious. And it feels really good to stand over somebody victorious up and down, doesn't it? So let it be you, as opposed to you kind of looking up at somebody. That's the goal. I want you guys to be all champions here. In your own way, or actually having a belt, which is sweet as anything. Overview on supplements real quick here. At the professional level, you get tested. You gotta abide by the, the WADA rules and regulations. Guys get popped without knowing what they're taking at the times. So getting a pharmaceutical grade supplement, you know, instead of taking extra testosterone and cycling and doing a little balco action there, um, some of the guys I know very well went through the balco stuff and it was stressful as anything. 
try not to get caught. We just talked about stress real briefly. Let's not do that. Creatine. Creatine's been around forever. Creatine's been shown to be very safe for a lot of individuals. It's cheap as anything. Keeping teaspoonful a day, and you're going to be faster, jump higher, uh, stronger. All these positive things. Creatine is a big buy. It's a big plus. And you guys take any uh, other supplements? I have a powder. Good. I'm glad you said protein powder because I was going to say amino acids next. In lieu of protein powder. Now you got your branch chain aminos. Those are the cheap ones, the BCAAs. Then you take the essential aminos, which you got all the BCAAs in there. But what your body actually does, it takes what you need. If your body needs leucine, it's going to take it from somewhere else that's not getting it and convert it into that function. If it doesn't have it, you're SOL. The BCAAs are incomplete in that case. Taking a full essential amino, so that means that your body doesn't actually produce them. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're far better for you. And you can't overdose on them, and you're not going to get popped. Plus, the calories are less than a calorie for the whole thing. Now, if you take something such as a whey protein, whey is the most bioavailable protein source out there as a protein, when you're taking protein, if you would. But you're really only absorbing 30% of that. The rest of that is being converted into waste product. So I don't like to waste my money. You guys, by taking a protein shake like that, could be wasting your money. Now, if you take a meal replacement in lieu of that, now you're, you're getting all your nutrients. It's like having a meal. I'm on the run. I got to go from here to here. I'm training. I don't have time to, to make a burger. So let me just enjoy my meal replacement. The protein powders on their own, after whey, we start getting into bioavailability. You get the plasma protein. I know you love the plasma protein. So good. <laughs> Don't take the leachy beef protein. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> then you start getting all the vegan proteins, and you're not absorbing any of that. So what's the point? You're really not absorbing jack squat of that. From a, the recommendation is to take a essential amino acid, chug it throughout the day, make multiple servings of it throughout the day. You can't have too much. You turn your body, because you have the aminos free floating around in your plasma, more of an anabolic state, so that simply means that you're going to be recovering. You're building your muscle back. You're building back all your tendons and ligaments. Everything that you need <laughs> and need not to be injured is building it back. So that would be a definite high, high, high recommendation. When it comes to actually performance in the ring and here, just a, a simple, I mean, we can go absolutely crazy on all the things, but a lot of what you guys are doing is endurance. So if you get too gassed or too winded, if you take something um, which is banned, like clenbuterol, for instance, like that, you may end up, while it's a great fat burner, you may end up breathing too hard and needing your second wind like that. Uh-oh, there's a problem. Before you know it, your ass is on the mat. So, a cup of coffee, cool. Multiple cups of coffee, believe it or not, too much caffeine is banned by the World anti doping Association. So, um, moving on with that, going to SARMs. I know SARMs are huge out there. SARMs are also illegal. <laughs> Just my best advice is to stay away from that stuff. If you need something such as that for recovery, there's pretty much one to take, and that's BPC-157. You simply take some drops on that, it's going to help your body, actually it's injectable, excuse me. You can take it here, uh, orally, which will help the gut health, however, it is an injectable, lightly under the skin, you take a little diabetes pin, uh, insulin pin, I should say, and it's going to help super recover. There's another one such as that called TB500, uh, that's banned. So, <laughs> the perfect combination would be both those together, but I'm just going to say, stick with the BP, and you guys will be absolutely fine with that. And that's only, as I'm gonna say, you're injured. You got 30 days, there's a fight coming up. Let's face it, you need the money. You're gonna get in there, you don't wanna get your ass kicked. You like having a record of that's winning. In that case there, you'd be fine to take that under a physician's supervision. I'm gonna put that caveat out there for you. Um, when it comes to other supplements, a lot of it's fluff. 
Anybody here taking multivitamin? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advise you to save your money. Why? A lot of things in there uh, will compete against each other. If they're competing, these minerals are competing against each other, then they're not doing you any good. Do you need all those vitamins and minerals in the first place? Have you taken a micronutrient test? Then how do you know what you're deficient in? You're just kind of hoping that you're taking everything that you need. But what if you're taking too much of something? What if your copper levels are already at the highest peak, for instance, and now you're taking more copper in this multivitamin? Now you're overdosing on copper. Now you're going to start having the deleterious effects of that. And that's just one of many examples in there. So we don't want to be overdosing on this stuff either. Um, selenium is another good one. Here in the United States, we have enough selenium in the soil still that by eating a regular diet, we're cool, we're good. In the UK, the selenium levels are far lower, and they might need a level like that. It's going to help you with immune function, it's also going to help you with testosterone production, uh, recovery, but if you're taking too much, you're going to have opposite effects on that. Your testosterone may be lower, your immune function may be lower, but you had the best intentions at heart, and you're trying to build them up. So, it's on the, uh, on the flyer here, if you ain't testing your guessing, that's what it exactly means. Always test for success. What are your hormone levels? What are your nutrient levels? Even foods. Uh, Dr. Shantae here will talk about, um, she has been a competitive figure champion. Mm -hmm. So the first couple competitions were absolutely hell on trying to lose body fat, for instance. And then with the right testing of the foods, realized that literally the chicken and the chocolate whey protein and the things that was the staple of the diet were causing inflammation. Not inflammation like you see, like your elbows blowing up here, but the internal inflammation that you're now not absorbing the foods that you thought you were actually absorbing in the first place. So instead of getting here, tons, 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 a lot more stress. When do you guys usually eat when it comes to training? And let me back this up here. Do you guys usually train in the morning, afternoon, or just kind of all over the place based on your schedule? Every day. Every day? Pretty much all of you guys? Yeah, all over the place. How many of you guys, do you guys ever train first in the morning, get up, come on over here? Okay. <laughs> and also just curious because today's the weekend. Um, what, <laughs> what time in the morning would you guys train at? And then, which time do you usually get up, like, during the week? Okay. And it's usually you get up at the same time in the morning? Like, even, like, tomorrow morning? Well, tomorrow, I'm actually probably a lot earlier because I get here at, like, 6.45 in the morning. Okay. But what I'm asking for is, like, kind of habits. Because if you, for instance here, if you wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, usually, and say you're going to go out and do a run, there's no reason to have to eat in that case here. What you're doing is you're shutting off your growth hormone, which is helping you recover. You are shutting down fat burning, which having that fat in your blood system there is fuel. So you might as well use that for fuel and you'll actually have a, more for a far more efficient and better training session than not. But if it's gonna be a few hours typically in between and you're gonna be going at it hard in here, then typically hour and a half two hours ahead of time would be a safe bet. And obviously, you guys know by this point, hopefully not a huge meal. <laughs> um, also comes down to the type of body that you have. Uh, I don't know, if, have you guys heard of the movie that we've been making? Oh, the past you ever seen anything? I don't think it came out. So COVID came out and business, yeah, got, and business got slower and I went to my bucket list like, what did I always want to do? I want to make a movie, let's make a movie. Let's make a full-length documentary, get it up on Netflix, do the whole uh, tour, canes, and all that kind of stuff. Let's make a high-quality movie. Uh, what can we do that's really retarded? I'm getting so, lost. <laughs> PTSD? And, <laughs> and you guys ever seen... Um, Super Size Me? Yeah, Super Size Me? Yeah. So you guys that haven't seen Super Size Me, the premise is this guy for an entire month is going to McDonald's. And before he goes, he's going to get all his lab work done. He's gonna only eat McDonald's and if for 30 days, and if they ask him, would you like to supersize, he has to say yes. And then afterward, let's do the test again and see now that it looks like you're dying. 
So back when I actually saw it, I thought, this is stupid. He's killing himself. What would happen if we took away the bun, if we took away the soda, if we took away the pie, if we took away the vegetable cooked fries, which is cancerous in vegetable oil, and just gave him the patties and water? No condiments, no pickles, just one of the freaking Burger King burger patties every day for a month. <laughs> so I had to figure out how to keep this guy alive for 30 days. 20 patties a day. 20 patties a day. So you did it? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we did it ahead of time. Using a Fitbit, we figured out what he needs if uh, required calories. Assuming my body actually absorbed all of it, which it did not. <laughs> None. And then we went and got brain scans done. We did every type of lab testing. testing. We did physical testing on him and ran the gamut. And then we went to Burger King and you guys got to see the first thing that I pull up. It's like 140 hamburgers, please. Excuse me, sir. I think I got wax in my ears, he says. It was legit. We bought 140 burgers, patties only, no bun, yep. per week. So the first day, if you can stomach it, it was still nice and warm. By the next morning, they're all cold. and So he obviously is just going to pound them because he's an animal. It's for science. And it's for science. <laughs> And he did it. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's amazing, though. No. Whole point is, by the end of the day, his testosterone levels were that of a pre-infantile girl. I mean, they plummeted. I became hypothyroid, became anemic, estrogen, mm -hmm. estrogen went sky high. Uh, I would puke in my mouth literally every day after day four. Remember this going on? Some people said I was a little grumpy. I don't know. I think we're making that up. Super psyched. Yeah. Felt all the quality of food makes a difference with the short of it. Now, after we're, he went on a little bit of a pescatarian, a lot more vegetable reset before he went on a whole grass fed beef for another 30 days. He flourished. Absolutely flourished on that. I personally take beef for 30 days and I thrive. We have different body types. And you three guys, four guys there, you all have different body types. Which, simply broken down, I can't give each of you the same diet. <laughs> if you do the same diet, you're all going to react differently. Half of you may thrive. One of you may thrive. The other may falter. We can give, obviously, a generalization and then hone in and tweak on things like that. And that's why I love lab testing. So we know as a fact what you need, what she needs, what I need, what all you have here need, and it just works out so much better. So that's why I say one size doesn't fit all. Figuring out what works for you and what is best is key to help you perform. Kind of make sense? So <laughs> there's so many diets out there, and all I ask you, and I beg and plead, just don't fall for market. That's it, all it is, it's marketing. It's the same thing that's been done since the 1900s, just packaged up, polished up nice, got a new pretty girl on this, got a new guy that's all chiseled, and saying, this is exactly what I do, it's not. They, they just got paid to say that. It, it's marketing. So don't fall for the marketing. Figure out what is best for you, and go with that. And if it gets boring, suck it up, buttercup. It is what it is. It, it, it's just how your body works. So let's make your body work at its best. So now I'm going to segue how to make the body work its best from the brain. I was going to say, the brain and body work <laughs> in unison together. So having you know, experience as an athlete, having experience in the world of sports psychology, and then a doctorate as well, how our mind works ultimately affects how our bodies respond. So you guys do any mental imagery, visualizations, training? Meditation? Meditation is good. But physically, did you do any sports before this? No, yeah, I played college soccer. Soccer? I played basketball. Basketball? No, nothing. Nothing, okay. So basketball is great because free throws, how were you at free throws? Pretty good. Okay. Did you ever lay in bed at night and just imagine sinking those free throws? Yeah. How did you perform the next day? There you go. So mental imagery and rehearsal is a huge benefit to sports performance. 
When we think about the outcome that we want, whether it's running a race and getting a specific time, whether it's sinking 10 out of 10 shots, whether it's how quick you can pin your opponent, right? You go through these motions in your head and it creates the neural pathways for the brain and the body to connect on that action. So when you talk about peak performance and the difference between you know, amateurs, intermediates, and super elite levels, that's what they do. They go in there and they rehearse every aspect of a fight. You know, we, we work with several boxers, we work with other professional athletes, and getting them to see and visualize, here, here, what are you doing? How do you react? What is your next step? You always want to be two steps ahead of your opponent, but how do you train your brain to do that? You rehearse. That way you know what to expect. You can get in there, and I use something called biofeedback, which won't get too much into, but it allows you to actually see your body's stress responses in certain situations. So if I were to hook you up to equipment and watch your heart rate, for instance, and I say, you're about to get punched in the face, we're gonna see that heart rate skyrocket, right? Your adrenaline kicks in, yes? You guys all experience that, I'm sure, in training here, right? So that, that fires you up, but does it cripple you, okay? So learning how to overcome what your body does and retraining the brain to get this new information allows you to disperse it in a more efficient manner. I did figure competitions for about three years and nutrition was a huge component to that. You know, getting up and, and training multiple hours every single day, going through weight cuts, going through, you know, hell on earth and peak week, you know, saunas and I, we don't mix, but it's part of it. So can you train your brain to understand the purpose of what you're doing, right? Who's done a weight cut? A few times. A few times? No, okay. So it's not an easy process. And Dr. Brandon will absolutely attest to that. We actually have other uh, on fitted and cutting. Um, did you do? The 27 pound five Yes. So we don't ever recommend that, but it can be done. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a method to everything. You know, in the world of bodybuilding, it's not like fighting, but there's diligence, there's discipline, there's calorie counting, there's activity planning. And there's recovery. Dr. Jim over here is explaining, you know, the benefits of recovery. If you're not getting the right amount of sleep to let your body flush out the toxins, to let your body repair itself, to get the quality of sleep that you need. Granted, 7.6 hours is the average of what we need, but what's your quality of it? Are you waking up throughout the night? Are you having trouble falling asleep? Are your workouts too late at night? Are they too early in the morning? All of this plays a factor into your overall performance. That makes sense. You ever waken up like super like ready to go and just got like that amazing night's sleep and you're like, I can conquer the world versus some days you wake up like I can't even get out of bed. What's the difference? What did you do? How did you recover? What did you eat? All these things play a factor into the peak performance side of it. You know, working with the people, you know, we, we work with them all over and it's checking in on phone calls. You know, it's, you know, are you using your technologies? Are you going through progressive muscle relaxation, which is a way to train your body to tense and release so that if you notice you're going to be able to breathe properly, you mentioned heart rate variability. I'm sure you guys have no idea what that is, right? No. So heart rate variability is the measure of what our nervous systems are doing. So we can have sympathetic responses that fight or flight Coming, a tiger is chasing you, you are going to run or you are going to be eaten, right? That's the adrenaline kicking in. We also have our parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest. You are sharp as a tack and that they're not going to derail you because you have trained your body to breathe at the proper rate and aligning with your heart rate. That's what heart rate variability measures. It's the measure of the difference between what your heart rate and your breath rate are doing, allowing you to perform at your peak. So I love training athletes to help you find what rhythm is best for you to breathe. You know, we want to see nice synchronous waves. I can do a you know baseline test and see a stressed nervous system. Is it erratic? You know, breathing you know like this. Are you getting enough deep oxygen? 
you guys feel sluggish after a workout or invigorated? Depends. No, I mean, then that's good. It should depend on what you're doing. You know, is it more cardio training? Is it more sparring? Is it, you know, straight strength training? Your body's going to respond differently to all of those. But how do you breathe? Yeah, if you step on the scale, how, long, how many hours until you walk into the ring? I think maybe one. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's much different based on if you have one hour versus when I had 24. So it makes a big difference on what weight you're going to choose for and how you're going to recover from it. So like a lot of things I've done, on average, I usually lost about 17 pounds for grappling tournaments. I would not be able to do that if only I had an hour to recover. Uh, at least not nearly as well because it took a bigger toll on my body. So. How much weight did you lose last night? I wasn't too far off. Uh, it's coming down to lots of small things you have to do so you can walk on the mat and more so recover afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of small tricks to it. Small generalized ones. I had different bodies work under different things, so this may or may not be the most relevant to you. But when it comes down to carbohydrates, like we, I'm sure you guys heard about going keto, so to speak, or should you have carbs, should you not have carbs? Is fruit good, is fruit not good? Should you eat all meat? When it comes to weight cutting, well, and don't try anything new the first like two weeks before your fight. Do not eat anything new. Do not take any new supplements. You don't know how your body's going to respond. So now and previously to now is the time for you guys to we'll call it, play around with it, but don't do anything new. Uh, but when it comes down to weight, a lot of it, we know body fat, but it's also a lot of water weight. And we're talking carbohydrates. I don't care what type it is. They retain water which is one of the big things if you ever heard people talk about going in ketosis, they lost a bunch of weight. It doesn't appear to really change your metabolism much, but every gram of carbs you hold holds about two, well over two grams of water. So just decreasing your carb intake will get you to lose water weight. But if you're used to a higher carb diet and you drop down significantly, you're gonna get tired for a couple of, about seven to 10 days until your body adapts for it. So again, if you guys are used to low carb, it's a great way to help get you at a better lower weight because you just retain less water. Uh, and that can be significant. 
Um, like I know in a normal, just a training session here, I'm usually down about five pounds of water weight when I leave. So anything you can cut down like that, water weight's so much easier to get off and hold off, and then you can just eat more vegetables and steak. And there's, I don't think there's too many people are gonna be too upset about that. Um, so you can always go more specific on how to cut weight, but if you're only within five or 10 pounds, you gotta get a start from it. And an individual, again, when are you eating? Uh, how much are you eating? I'm usually at one meal, sometimes we'll call it one and a half meal a day. I know you guys are very similar with it. But it depends on you to get used to what you're doing. Uh, if you're doing three meals and you guys are fighting three weeks, I wouldn't change anything yet. <laughs> right? It's a time in between training camps to kind of see what does your body like and how to get used to everything. Recovery part is huge. Whether you lost five pounds or you lose 20 pounds, you got to be able to compete afterwards. And the type of recovery, again, is different based on how much weight you had to lose. If you're talking 10 pounds, maybe all you need to get in is a little bit of caffeine, redo a B-complex, and get a little bit of sugar and protein in you so you can go. Um, when we talk about it, it's a little bit. Like, I don't know, again, I'm gonna keep coming back to you because I know you fought most recently. What did you have after you weighed in the scale? Why don't we leave it now? Nothing to say.